Perfect. And, uh, and now I give uh, the floor to Anna to introduce the other seminar series. And once more, thank you very much for coming today. And uh, after the, um, the presentation, uh, we will have a session of questions and answers. I uh, will collect the, the questions through Zoom. Uh, we can, you can write your uh, questions on the chat, or if you want to intervene, uh, in, we can, you can also do it this way both from the room and from the virtual room. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, good afternoon to all and thank you all for coming to this, uh, to this joint session. Um, before we begin, I would just like to say a brief words on my behalf and, and Margaret Nico, with, with whom I coordinate this, um, this seminars. Um, first of all, we sincerely hope everyone is well and, and, and safe. Uh, and second, it's a pleasure to have this um, joint session with a monthly seminar on social movements and political action. Um, I think it's a good way to combine efforts, um, dissemination practices and the establishment of networks uh, when there are topics, approaches and methods that can somehow build bridges um, between these kind of initiatives. And that's what, hap what happens today um, with, with today's session, which combines the, the methodological dimension of observing the life course uh, with the stu study of social movement. So we have this bridge between the two, um, the two topics. For those of you who haven't heard about the cycle of seminars on biographies and trajectories, which, which is an initiative uh, organized by, by Magda Nico and I here at CSISCTE. We, we the main goal of this cycle of seminars is to uh, provide a space for ongoing and, um, and already developed biographical research to be known and to be discussed in, in detail, to disseminate innovative um, and creative practices of doing biographical research and study lives, uh, to promote the dialogue between um, different research traditions and also emergent trends in these domains to encourage the, the reflection and the debate around this, uh, the, this processes of collection, construction and interpretation of biographical accounts um, and also uh, life calendars and also to contribute to establish research networks uh, concerning biographical re research, um, the social trajectories and also life course studies that we will have here today. So this is basically a platform for discussion and debate um, in our cycle of seminars, mainly with a methodological focus um, on, on biographical research and life course approaches. And we believe that with this joint session, we uh, can somehow tackle these different goals that we have with this um, cycle of seminars. Um, we have a website, we can also uh, put it in, perhaps in the chat room if you want to visit and sign up in, in our mailing list to, be, um, to know the, the, the scheduled sessions we have. Um, but without further ado, and because we are, we are already uh, running a bit late, uh, the session will be chaired by Maria Silva, a um, researcher here at CSISCT, and she's a specialist in the topics of education, family, uh, and political socialization of working class. Uh, and she has been working on these topics, not only in Brazil, but also here in Portugal. So Maria, the floor is yours, and we can begin. I think you will hear me better. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank Magda, Anna, Guia, and Tiago for inviting me to be here today uh, to comment this section and uh, to listen to Olivier Filier's contributions on talks to are so close, too close to my heart, and uh, that accompany my traje trajectory of studies and interests of research. Today, we have a special section special because it's a collaborative effort. It is a joint section. We have the great privilege of being here to listen to Olivier Filleul. He will be talking with us about the sociology of life course from a dispositional interactionism. Olivier, who is an important reference in studies of political sciences, especially in studies of social movements, activism, and militantism. He is professor of political sociology at the University of Lausanne, and the senior research at CNRS also. Um, Olivier has conducted uh, his research in three uh, directions, 
that dynamics uh, of social and political mobilizations, state management of social conflicts, repression in democracy, democratic in uh, authoritarian context, and uh, the sociology of commitment and militant careers, including disengagement, the history of the social sociology of mobilizations and re reflections on the, its methods and instruments. So there are a lot of articles, papers, and books to sit here, but the time is very uh, a little reducing. Uh, I had uh, the opportunity to get the to know part of the Olivier's work when I was still a student in Brazil, and uh, that helped me to try to try to put the puzzle of the movement of the ABC metallurgical uh, metal workers in Brazil, and also in a collaborative way to development of the research we have been doing in partnership with my professor Kimi Tomizaki in Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo. At the head of the research group Tramas, it's a, a group of studies a laboratory for education, intergeneration transmission, and work and politics. Before I hand over to Olivier, I will make a few uh, comments about his relevant contributions to the study of the social movements and political commitment. We start with the importance of bringing the individual actor into the focus of social movement studies. Olivier proposed a sociological return to the analysis of the social movement, uh, social movement theory, exploring the effects of the engagements on the life course uh, of individuals who participated in different moments and in different contexts. And today, we will talk about the afterlives of uh, French Soissantiers and the Yellow Vest movement in France. Uh, he points in, uh, to the need to adjust our lens and look at uh, individual biographies, examining uh, the sociological, uh, the sociobiographical effects of political commitments. Life history appears here as a fundamentally important tool to analyze individual and collective biographies, seek to understand how biographies are constructed. And he proposes looking at engagement as a process. He suggests longitudinal analysis of activist trajectories, adopting multi-level approaches. That is, they engender or modified, uh, sorry, uh, and he remind, remind us that engagement bring effects, and it's so important. He suggests longitudinal, longitudinal analysis of activist trajectories, adopting multi-level approaches. And he reminds you the engagements bring effects. That is, they engender or modify dispositions, exert effects, bring impacts or consequences throughout the life course of individuals' lives. And this is not the only political sphere, but in all dimensions of individuals' life. Social movements socialize politically. We must also pay attention to the socializing character. So I will propose some brief reflections, and I don't know if it will be a consensus, but it's just to think it's only to start to start to talk about, about politics. According to Nona Meyer, politics is an ambivalent phenomenon. It can be sometimes what unites and what divides, what imprisons and what frees, the affairs of the political class and of the ordinary citizens. And the affairs of the ordinary citizens import. And what are the consequences of all this in the life course, in the life of people, in the life of the adults in the secondary socialization? And secondly, according to Ortega y Gasset, we only have our history and it's not ours. Or better, she's ours, but not only ours. And this part, it's on me. I leave an invitation for us to think. Our history are not only ours. They are part of broader histories that stretch across time and space towards the past and also the future. And our ways of relating to the universe of politics are also tributaries of multiple histories. The histories of the generation that precedes. The histories lived in the present situated in specific political, economic, and social configurations, 
and sometimes this escapes us. And the histories we can conceive for the future are all end of the generation, the generations that we also said this. It is individual, institutional, and contextual. It is also interdependent, as Norbert Elias would say. Finally, in a society, people do politics. Some people say that every human action can be politicized by its actor. In fact, people stay in protests, social movements, and institutions. They are playing roles, learning, and teaching, inheriting and transmitting, dedicating their lives to changing things, interacting with other people, building, building or acting in institutions in a society marketed by social inequalities. All this has impacts and the course of life goes on and the history moves on. So I stop here. <laughs> And for the organization of the session, we will um, start with Professor Olivier Fillier. Uh, and after his presentation, we will have a debate when you were uh, to able to do comments and uh, ask a question for the speakers. So the audience and I looking forward to hearing it. And uh, as not to waste more time, I thank you for your attention. And now the floor is yours. I shared it. I shared, no? Hmm? I think I shared it. I will, we have. <clears throat> okay, th thank you, everybody, and especially you three, you four, for having invited me to present some of my work. Uh, we'll try to get the PowerPoint on. Voilà. Ça marche? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what? I will try. I mean, let's say we have like half an hour, not more, because if we have, want to have a. Okay, so perhaps I will skip some, some slides, but it's not a problem. Um, what I would like to do today is, 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 let's say, to do two things. One, which is kind of simple, and I will be kind of quick on it because I'm sure you all are aware of those theories and those, those, those things, is to explain what I, what I, with many other of my colleagues, of course, are defining as um, militant careers or activist careers, okay? And, and then I will, I will try to, in a very sketchy way, but I will try to give you what's behind in terms of theory, let's say. Um, and then, um, I will try to, to take an example, the example of the 68ers and what they became after 50 years. Uh, so the biological consequences of having been uh, involved in those movements in the 70s. When we talk about the 68, 68 years, it's like all the 70s. Huh? And, and um, because it's for me an, exam an example that, that helps me to illustrate what I'm like working on like precisely, that is collective biography. But it's not a way of saying we should do collective biography. I mean, you can do exactly this. I mean, you can do with the same theory. I will try to uh, present sketchily. Um, you can work on like one biography. This is not the point. But then I, I can have the two. Um, so you have more or less a, <laughs> the menu. Alors, um, can we get rid of this or si. no? I can also stop this. Ah, super. Merci beaucoup. So, yeah. um, so I did. I did develop those those ideas about um, activist careers. In uh, I think I started to work on this with again with uh, it's, it has always been a collective work with with different colleagues. Uh, I think at the end of the nineties, and and first we did we did work on uh, ACT UP and Ed Aid Ed en français, uh, which are anti anti AIDS movements. And at that time, I was working on like biographies, like taking like some some, some individuals and trying to uh, to work on their on their life trajectories and, and connect it to like bigger a bigger picture, like at the meso and macro level. And then slightly, I I, I moved to because also we, we got new instruments, let's say, a new way of doing statistics. Uh, I moved to collective biography. Again, not that 
because I think it's better, but I, I wanted to explore this, uh, this dimension. As you know, uh, interactionist sociology has always been very vocal against statistics, uh, because statistics are, are just describing things without putting any temporal dimension in it. But since like, let's say, because of Abbott's work and, and the development of sequence analysis and many other methods, and um, event history analysis, and even if I don't use it, I don't think it's free. But everything, all those things develop. And nowadays we can combine without being in contradiction, uh, an interactionist approach and uh, the use of statistics. Well, this is my main point, actually. Huh? Uh, the rest is just like the ground tour. Alors, uh, no, it's like so. Okay. Trees. The first thing to say is that, I mean, about this interactionist approach is that it's based on the definition of socialization, which is, I mean, largely shared now, but which is quite different from the way we were, we used to define socialization at, let's say, 20 years ago. Um, because, so I'm, I'm starting with Berger and Lukman, I mean, famous definition of uh, socialization, uh, and mainly around the idea of primary and secondary socialization and the idea that between primary and secondary socialization, there are a lot of differences, of course, uh, but in a way, uh, the main idea is that secondary socialization is certainly as important as primary socialization. And in, cer in certain circumstances, it can even like erase or, or put aside what has been, um, what has been um, like um, interiorized in the primary socialization. So, it's very, it's very simple. We are, we are, if, if you know a bit the literature about socialization, this falls into the lifelong openness model, what we call the lifelong openness model, which means we consider socialization is act active all along your life cycle. With a question, a question mark for the very, very old people, this we don't really know. And I think with my, my next uh, research to work on very old people and do they, do they continue to accumulate some, some new, um, uh, how do you say, some new dispositions, some new ways of thinking, etc. This we, I, I think for now, we don't really know. So the lifelong openness model combined with what my name says about, you know, it's old, old books, huh? 1952, but it's very useful, we don't need to. Um, my name has this idea of generation and impressionable years model. And I think by combining the two, uh, it becomes very interesting for social movement scholars. Why? Because in social movements, we all agree on the fact that we work on, I mean, mainly work on people who are quite young. Like social movements are populated by young people. And this is a real quick, like students, etc. And, and this is, is, is also something very interesting and you can't not see this elephant in the room. That's why the combination with Mannheim is very interesting because you have this lifelong competence model, but also the idea that um, after like being a teenager and a young adult, old, the, the, the way you, you can be socialized, the way you can like uh, acquire new dispositions is very strong. I and mean, it's, it's really a moment of, of uh, and it's exactly the moment when people are more active in, in social movements. So this has three consequences. Um, I, the first I already commented. So primary and secondary socializations are equally important, let's say, even if, well, let's say equally important. Um, as a consequence, not only family and schools are socializing agents, and then we come to the social movement as a social agent, social, <laughs> socializing agent also, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, but also to the idea that it's necessary to explore different life spheres, even if you are only interested in what people do or what people think and how people are behaving in uh, political activities. This idea, I will come back to it later. I think it's very important, this idea of combining different life spheres and finding a way to combine it for real. I mean, we know how to do it on one biography, like qualitatively, of course, but um, with statistics, it's more complicated. And as you said, I wouldn't insist on it because you, you, you already mentioned it. Um, the political dimensions at play in all socializing process, which means that um, the realm of politics is not, I mean, is, it's everywhere. There is no, there is no uh, conduct, no behavior, even in routine life, which can't be uh, uh, reflected and then think, studied as political, okay? 
So this is very important because it means that uh, it's not only politics in terms of like voting, uh, political participation, whatever, it's also like also a routine way of dealing with life. Um, like, uh, any kind, any kind of uh, discrete uh, or hidden things, like and, and then you think about the hidden transcript of James Scott, whatever, etc. This is all part of the picture. So we have to. That's also why we have to study the multiple sphere of life because there is politics everywhere, like even in family life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and at the end, we can we can coin this approach as a dispositional interactionism. What does it mean? It means, okay, it's interactionism because we use those authors and we'll come back to it, like uh, Everett Hughes, uh, Howard Baker, uh, Arsene Strauss, mo mostly for me, but also uh, a dispositional sociology, which means we, can't, we still consider that, as Bourdieu says, huh, uh, we still consider that people through the socialization process are accumulating dispositions. Okay, and what we call habitus in, in uh, Bourdieu's sociology. And this, we think, I say we because again, it's like a collective work. Uh, we think that this uh, critical sociology, Bourdieu's critical sociology, when it comes to dispositions, is totally in line with an interactionist approach. It, it works well together. There is no epistemological gap hidden behind, as, as very often when we mix you know, methods and without. So that's my. That's my um, that's my stand, but it's also what Bernard Lahir is defending. And I think, if I remember well, when I read this book in 1998, um, I, I finally found, I, I mean, I was so happy because I, uh, I was more like into Bourdieu sociology, but I was more and more attracted by uh, interaction in sociology. I was like fascinated. It was just a time, just two or three years before, um, the Baker was translated in French and all those books were starting to be translated. And, and, and then, I was so happy to find a way to combine it. So thanks to Lai, let's say. Alors, the notion of a career, it's, I mean, I will go fast because I think we all, you all have an idea of what it is, but I, so I, I have like here two, um, two quotations which are sufficient to, to explain what is, a, what is the idea of a career. First, there is the idea that a career is a mix of objective situations and, um, and a moving perspective, that is, People through their life are experiencing different, different, uh, are doing different experience, uh, different kind of uh, position, different kind of roles, as, as you said. And each at each stage, I will, if I have time, I will come back to this notion of stage, which is kind of um, um, problematic. But at each stage of one's life, you occupy a certain position in society, you fulfill certain roles, and this produces. Um, some uh, different way of seeing life, of giving meaning to what's happening to you and to what's happening to the others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a career is a succession, succession of phases, and at each phases, people change in those two at those two levels. Okay. The second, um, the second uh, quotation is, is, is coming from this very famous text I and mean, paper from Baker, as an introduction to the Jack Roller, uh, ninety six. Uh, and, and, and Becker is really thinking in terms of steps. He's trying, as we know, like in, in, for different behaviors. And I'm not really here, actually, because the idea of Becker is that you, you have to identify the stages people will go through. And those stages, in a way, are considered as universal stages. But like if you're a marijuana smoker, like me, you will, you will go through all those stages, okay? There is no other route. Um, in the way we work with, with, uh, with this notion of career, it's a little bit different. It's, it's closer to Anselm Strauss, which means that we don't, we're not looking for stages. We're not looking for a pattern, which would be like the sign of something structural. Like, uh, no, uh, each person has not its own pattern, but its own um, way. And that's why it's more, it's more complicated. I think it's more complicated. And that's why I think we need collective biography to make sense of those lives who, are, who, who seem at first sight very different from, from each other. Actually, of course, there are patterns, but not in terms of stages, you know? And if you think about activist careers, it would make no sense to think in terms of stages because at the end, it will come back to the old sociology of activism. Let's say there is a phase of engagement, there is a phase of, uh, I don't know, high level activities, and there is a phase where you are kind of being like, uh, uh, you feel discomfort and then, and then you leave. It's not that interesting. Uh, I mean, I think. Um, 
more, uh, I continue on, on this notion of career to give like, again, it's very sketchy, but we can come back to this uh, in the question. Um, there is the idea that they are, they are, they are, <laughs> they are chronically, we have, I said it, we have to take care of the different spheres of life, okay? Um, and usually we identify it because we have to simplify the sphere of life, which is related to, let's say, political activity, activism, uh, the sphere of life related to family life, affective ties, like um, what are children, uh, sexual relationships also, and, and all those things. And synchronically, we also consider that um, the individual is like a gate a door to understand what's going on structurally. Like we're really, I insist on this, we're not at all, because I'm, I'm also with working in Lausanne with the Lives uh, Center and they are psychosociologists and, and they are more working on the lifespan that is like the human change through life. We're not at all here. We're, we're only interested in individual because individuals are the door that, that, that allows you to understand social structure and the way it evolves, okay? And, and so it means you always have to contextualize commitments with a, a meso-organizational level, level, that is uh, the social movements where you're involved, so groups where you belong, and a macro level, which is like, like uh, no need to be uh, explained. Alors, there are two essential dimensions in my way or way of defining careers, um, which are directly taken from Strauss's book, Mirrors and Masks. So I'm, I'm, I'm not inventing anything. Uh, everything I say, I, I say is coming from this literature. I'm just putting it, let's say in another way, that's it. Um, the first thing which is very important in, in this book is the idea of the transformation of identities. So, uh, and I think the ways, even the, the vocabulary they use is more interesting than the vocabulary we use now to, de to define those things because many people have other words for those things. So transformation of identities, which means two things. One, we are going through institutional changes, of course, this, this is kind of uh, evidence for you, I guess. Uh, so changing the status, blah, blah, blah. And turning points. Turning points are um, crises, failures, events, uh, experiences that will make your life change. Perhaps not immediately, perhaps unconsciously, but let's say it's something that happens. It can be something that happens like, uh, for example, an accident, accident, and then you're disabled, okay? But it can be something that happens like um, in your head, okay? And uh, like your way of seeing things is completely changed by kind of experience. For example, we're in the seventies, you're a woman, you join a consciousness raising group, and then it's what we call a prise de conscience. It doesn't mean anything uh, soci uh, sociologically, but you know what it means, like uh, as a human being, like you, all of a sudden you discover that your situation as a woman, we're in the 70s, to be the same today, you discover that your situation as a woman is, is, is ça va pas. <laughs> it, it, it's, not, it's not okay. And, and since you share with other women, without the presence of men around, your experience, you discover that, that what happens to you, like for example, you, you have to cook when your husband is watching the, the football match, is not your only experience, it's something you all share. So this can bring some turning points, you know, in the way you think about the world, but also in, in the way you live. And um, this uh, is very important because when you look at biographies through interviews, you do live interviews, what we do, we try, and it's not identifying stages, it's trying to identify turning points, you know? So we're not looking for a stage that is defined uh, in advance uh, or after like uh, having worked on many, many biographies like, like with Becker. No, it's like for each person, the turning points will be perhaps different. And of course, it's more complicated to, to, to relate those uh, multiple possible turning points to structural uh, dimensions and factors, because it's less, uh, it's less simple, let's say. Um, the second point is uh, this idea of priority of sites. So this idea of my spheres. So I think I don't need to say more about it. Another um, 
concept that is very useful, I mean, necessary to understand what, what's going on is, uh, not, I mean, in my opinion, is the notion of co uh, configuration, figuration in, in German. This is, uh, it's coming from Elias, Norbert Elias, so I guess everybody knows it, but it's very important because it's, it's um, the starting point of it is that whatever you look at, what you look at is, is caught in a system of competitive interrelations. So if you look at one biography, this biography will have no meaning, no sense. It doesn't say anything if it's not related to other biographies, like other, I mean, a, a bigger world. I will come to this later, if I can. Um, and this is well in line with uh, narrative positiv positivism uh, defended by uh, Andrew Abbott, which in a way says that causal, I mean, the classical causal explanation is not that useful in what we're doing here. I mean, of course, causation is not something we, there are, everything is caused, let's say, but it's caused at each stage, if you think like Becker, or it's caused like yeah, uh, at every moment of your life. So the, the, the tricky thing is that we still think we have to look for causes, because those causes are multiple and, 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 and they are like uh, sequenced in time. And this is, this is what you have to build, I mean, to rebuild, to understand what's happening. I think uh, this more or less, I already uh, talked about it. Uh, since you're in a configurational approach, you have to articulate, try to articulate those three levels as usual, a micro, macro, and meso levels. But if you are uh, familiar with um, social movement sociology, you will notice that very often authors will use those three levels and talk about those three levels, which is very nice, but without articulating it, which means you have something about the micro level, you have something about the meso level, you have something at the macro level, and, 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 and that, that's it. But it's just the beginning of the work. I mean, what you have to do is to articulate the free at each stage, okay? Um, at the meso level, there is also something I want to, to point out, like what are the organizations doing to people? Um, there are two uh, mechanisms which are very important. And those two mechanisms are, are the first ones to have like um, discussed it and, and, and pointed it are Hans Gerf and, and Charles Wright Mills in 1954. So it's an old story. And they have very, very interesting chapters in the book about the selection of people, like the way social movements are selecting people. Usually in social movement studies, we just think like people are joining movements, but no, I mean, yes, they're joining movements, but you can join in movements and the door remains closed, okay? It, it happens very often or after one week you leave. Uh, and also social movements are, are, are trying to, to recruit. So the selection of people is a very important um, process that you have to study at the level of organizations. And what we call organization, organizational modeling, uh, as you said, refers to all the socializing effects of being part of, of a movement. Voilà. When you have those three levels to articulate, uh, I mean, with those three levels to articulate, we have, of course, a problem of uh, methods, how to do this. And then you have two main avenues. I would speak only about the last one and give you an example. Like, I, will, I don't know if I have time. But uh, the first thing we can do, of course, is consider that biographies are concentrated of structure. And then you can, like Elias in his book on Mozart, for me, the Mozart of Elias is just like, it's a genius book, it's not, it's unfinished, but it's exactly that. I mean, I mean you have the, and why? Because he's, if you read the book, he's talking about Mozart, okay, who is a genius. So this is the best thing to study, a genius. Like it's not like the others. And what he will try to, to show, and it shows it very well, is that this guy is a product of his, of, of his time, let's say, of, of the circumstances of, of um, what is being an artist at the time. Uh, but also, this is very, I mean, that's outstanding because it's not only that, he's also articulating this with some psychological traits of Mozart, which are built by the, through the relationship with his father. And he's trying to show that this psychological, uh, this relationship with his father is totally linked and modeled by the world where they are living. Like the authority of the father and the son is kind of um, it's the same, let's say, as the authority of, of the king, of the prince, and the artist. 
considered a solvent. So voilà, we can do this. Uh, Lahir does this, uh, Bernard Lahir. So you can take like, uh, for example, he recently published a book some years ago on uh, Kafka. And, and uh, so it's, I mean, the book itself is all about Kafka, his psychology, blah, 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 but all, all is referred to the world through which he will, he will uh, do his life. Course. And it's, I think, quite convincing. But what I will uh, talk about now is more collective biography or prosopography. Prosopography is a word that is more used by historians. And, and I wouldn't, uh, and there are good reasons to use this word for what they do and to use collective biography for, for what we do. It's, it's a question of a corpus, let's say, the way you build your corpus. But it's like, uh, oh, more. I want, alors, no. I think nobody can read perfect. It's in French. I just wanted to show you what we do when we work on one biography, just one. Uh, I mean, just one. Like, or uh, this. This is from a PhD of uh, one of my uh, doctoral students, Gilles Desclous, who just uh, defended like, last week, and he did work on uh, people who, in the seventies, were coming from like a Catholic world or Protestant world, like Chrétien de gauche, left Christians and we engaged in 68 and became leftist, blah, 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 and about like the, the life course, okay? And when he interviews those people, they're around 70, 75. And what he's building is kind of a time, uh, timeline with, well, you can't see, but <laughs> with a number of sequences. But the funny thing is that those sequences, I mean, the nice thing is that those sequences are not the same for everybody. All, Every people has different sequences. So the life, the life course is really different. But after that, that, um, that stage, you can then try to combine them. And, and that's why I will try to show you with a collective biography. But you can also stop here as he did in, in his PhD. He has a group of 25 people that have been selected, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and it's very convincing. And it can show, it can show that, that um, those biographies are largely defined by the structure in where they evolved, but each, each, um, each life course is in a way different, okay? Alors, uh, on the biographical consequences, I, can I, uh, or oh, I stop here because... Uh, no, 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 please, yeah, no Oui, alors I will talk a bit about uh, a research on 68 years, uh, 50 years after. This, those are the two books we published with. The first one, Changement, is a book we published with the, the whole team. And the other one is on Marseille, a city in, in, in France, which was part of the five cities we did study. Um, so the idea of this research was to try to show that the common knowledge about 68 years is kind of uh, not that true. You know, the common knowledge, I mean, you have here two, two quotations, is that uh, 68 years, 50 years after, uh, did very well, you know? I mean, there were students, they played a big uh, revolution during, in 68, uh, and, and, and two or three years after, or 10 years after, they started to be journalists, started to, uh, and then they became prominent people, making money, capitalists, whatever. So, and and this, this story, you will find it everywhere where you had uh, a movement in 68. You will find it in America, you will find it I mean, for, for the movement in 68. In America, you will find it in France, you will find it in Mexico, I think you'll find it also in Portugal, I mean, everywhere. And of course, it's not uh, by chance. I mean, when you tell the new generation, the young generation, you know, I mean, if you become a revolutionary, you will play for two or three years revolution like Rolling Stones, and then you will come down, you know, with age, you will become like, reasonable and make money. So no need to, to do this. So we, it, it was also, um, we had a political aim to show that it wasn't like that. Alors, this research was, was um, aiming at working on ordinary activists. So the only way to avoid uh, reproducing this, this common sense about 68 years was to get rid of all the people who are still known as having been the 68 years, like the, the leaders, let's say. Uh, or those who were not leaders at that time, but after a while succeeded in presenting themselves as having been leaders. And so the first difficulty is to find people who have disappeared in a way, 50 years after, they're very old. And to find people who are, who are into, uh, who were active in, in 68, 
and, and, and of course build a group, a corpus of people who is, of course, it can't be um, representative. It's impossible. We don't have a reference population, but a population which is, let's say, significant. And I will tell you how we did it. Um, and we worked on free movement families, again, because we have to simplify. I mean, the leftists, so all the leftist group, Maoists, Ma Ma Trotskyists, whatever, uh, the, the feminist movements, so a lot of movements, and workers' unions. The reason why those free groups is that because we knew and we were right that those free movements have been very much like um, intermingled during this period. And we knew that a lot of people moved from one movement to another. Because one of the nice things with collective biography also is that to, you can relate the movement of the, the people, like the, 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 the displacement of people in the social structure with the evolution of, of, the, of the groupings also. I will show you a graph that shows this. So we had three movement families, five cities. I don't, I don't uh, develop the, those details. And since we are doing sociology, since we think that biographies are interesting only if you can relate it to uh, structures, because they are used to understand the evolution of structures, this is the aim. We have to find, uh, I mean, we have to, to gather a lot of information on the whole period they have lived, which means we spend one year and a half in archives trying to, to find the, all we could find to describe precisely locally, what was the political life, but not only political life, in, in this city, I mean, we had five cities. And just to show you, because it, it's really like uh, half of the time we spend doing this, of the time of the research. Uh, if you don't have this, I think, I mean, your biographies are like floating in the air, in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's difficult to... So we had, we had uh, a lot of uh, data. So certainly the most important one was uh, administrative archives from the police that uh, allowed us to build a um, uh, database, a protest event database, cl classical. And then we could conduct some, like for example, here on those um, network analysis, you can see that along the period, so from 66 to 82, there is a funny thing, like at the beginning, you have a certain space which is very I mean, strongly built again, uh, around see, like the, um, the communist, um, Union, the communist party, blah, blah, blah. and then you have 68 and all the turmoil of 68, everything changes, it moves, like the third uh, network uh, map is totally different. But after 74, 75, you come back to the initial situation. Like, you know what I mean? Like 68 was just like a little window of, of, of turmoil and we came back to a stabilized situation which is more or less the same as before. The, and this is very important to understand like the opportunities that was offered to people after like, why, why do they stop me, uh, being activists? What can they do, etc. cetera? I and mean, we come back to the world before. I, I, uh, other kind of uh, documents we had, <clears throat> private archives, posters, leaflets, and the revolutionaries file. In France after six years, the, the Minister of Interior is, decided to um, like, um, built a file of all the revolutionaries in France. And it was suppressed in 1981 or 1982 after the, the socialist size power, I mean size power, uh, access to power in France. So this has been very precious because it's long list of people that have totally disappeared. And like, like this woman did, did um, I don't know, did, did participate to a demonstration. She threw uh, a stone, you will find a name in the file, it's police file. So it's uh, they are really looking for people. You have the addresses of that time, of course, it's, it was 50 years ago. So imagine after the work, I think, you know, perhaps uh, I'm sure you know the book of um, Doug McAdam, which has been very inspiring for us, of course. I mean, for me, it was like, uh, I started to think about those things after reading this book. And, and you remember that he, he spent a lot of time trying to find back the people who were part and would participate or not participate, you had the same problem. And, and Okay, and we, we did also a lot of uh, cartography because space is super important. I mean, the relation, I can't dig in it, but the relationship between space and biographies is, is, is key, let's say. Um, so at the end, there's a way we did work. Uh, we have no reference population, so we can't build anything representative. Okay, it's a it's, it's very often the case. 
So we started to do what we call an historical ethnography, which means trying to, to, to do what is ethnography, but of course of the past, so with different kind of methods. And we, 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 we started with um, interviews, informative interviews with people who, who had identified as having been part of 68 of the 60th movement in those cities that we could find that like through uh, telephone books or contacts through people, elected people, blah, blah, blah. And then since there is a risk of, of um, well, it's, uh, there's always a risk when you have a snowball sampling to, to, only, to only study on the, on, on the click. You know, to on repeat the, the... Way, to have all, all people were like, oh, uh, the word is not coming. <laughs> And, and so we, that's why we added the administrative archives and personal archives. For the feminists, for example, administrative, administrative archives were kind of empty because at that time they were not at all. The police wasn't interested in feminists, you know, it was like, but leftist, communist, yes, mm -hmm. that is very, <laughs> but that's interesting, or, or unionist. So for the, for the feminists, thanks to the fact that feminists are mostly women and women are good at writing, having diaries, I mean, you know, we, could, we couldn't find back a lot of things like that. But without, without that, we're dead. We, we, we should have dropped this, this part of the research. So at the end, we have identified on the five city, in the five cities around 3,700, huh? which makes a little bit less, around 700 per town. And then we selected the interviewees who wanted to interview among this big group of uh, 755. And then starts uh, like the police work, like we try to find back people. And we, we found them, I mean, we had a list and uh, we had a certain number of people to find, what criterion to select the people. Like for example, with the protest even database, we know since each demonstration, you have the number of demonstrators, which is indicated in the file. It's never the right number, but it's always the same, the same mistakes they make or the same uh, cheating they do. So you have an idea of the, of the relative strength of each group at each point in time, like when the Maoists are increasing in a city or decreasing, you know, so it's very important because you can follow through those archives, a lot of things which are related to the groups, the number of people in those groups, who are those people in the groups. And based on this, we did build a grid of selection for the interviewees. It's not representative again, but it's kind of nice. Um, and we built a control group with uh, uh, in, uh, a general, survey in, in general survey in general population and we just took the courts 1942 1957 that is people who are the same age more or less uh, as our interviewees and of course in each cities then we have we have a point of comparison again it's kind of um, it's loose but it's not bad compared to nothing you can you can see differences and the differences are so huge that i think you can trust it and to those interviews, we have um, added uh, life history calendars uh, because we wanted to do this collective biography. As well. So life history calendars, uh, I guess, perhaps you're familiar to it. Well, it's, 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 um, it's very nice instrument. So this one was the one we used. The idea is that you have, um, well, you have, you have the years, no, it's okay. You, you have the, um, the chronological time, and then when the, you have only like, uh, well, if you were born in 1985, you can, you can feel it, let's say. And then the first question is about your residential, uh, your, your residency. Uh, where did you live along your life and how? With your parents, with other friends, as a couple, etc. So all those uh, type of residents here, are the way, uh, the different kind of experience of, uh, of living. Then you have couple relationships, of course, birth or death of children, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you have a, a big, uh, so this is one life sphere, uh, affective life, life sphere. Then you have everything related to study and, and professions, like uh, your, the curriculum. And with some details about like uh, what kind of what kind of job you have, is it in the public sector, or private sector, blah blah blah. And then you have the militant uh, experience, activist experience, with two different two different kind of experiences. What is in pink is uh, being member of a group, okay, even if it's a loose membership, but you're a member of a group. Um, and the orange one 
is about events and campaigns. <coughs> because after we, we did add it after a while, because we didn't understand that in 68 as well as now. I mean, we were really thinking like very, I'm coming from social movement theory. So, you know, rational choice theory and then there are organizations, but no, it doesn't work like that. So, so of course we had to add the events, campaigns, and it, it, it can be much more important. And for the feminist movement, it's absolutely impossible not to have this. Alors, the nice thing with uh, live calendar is that the instrument itself is, uh, is very efficient uh, to help people remembering, because this is key. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything about the biases linked to biographies, whatever. I think we are all aware of it and we all know what we can do with it. But just say that uh, those life calendars are really super useful for people to remembering things. Just because, you know, the way you fit it is up, up to you. You can feel it like, okay, if you can remember, I was born this year and then I leave my parents and you, and you feel each column one after another. But actually when you're 70, 75, because those people I interview are kind of old and those had a long life and for, for men, most, more for than women, they don't really remember well because we're aging very fast as men. Uh, and, and so it helps because for example, even for men, they can remember when their children were born. Yeah, yeah, most of the time, not always. And then this helps, like, my, ah, my son was born this year. Ah, it's also when I started to work or when we moved. And then some people, those who have difficulties remembering, are feeling the life kind of more like horizontally than vertically. But at the end of the day, we really have um, a very nice result. And that's why I, I was mentioning this PhD student like a, a while ago with his, with his two graphs. He did a very qualitative interview, a qualitative research, sorry, with 25 uh, in-depth interviews, but he used a live calendar just to be sure his live interviews would be like complete. He wouldn't forget anything. We all have, I mean, you had, and I had, of course, many times, I'm sure you had too, this experience of like uh, doing like live interviews. And after, after it's uh, transcribed, you start to work on it and so many things you miss <laughs> and it's becoming like, um, difficult uh, and sometimes you lie but with the life calendar you say it <laughs> um, we also use sequence analysis and uh, optimal matching i don't know uh, if you know this uh, this method but to put it very briefly the idea is that it allows us statistically to take care, to take into account uh, the, the successive positions people have occupied, like structurally, like for example, the, the succession of professions, which means you are able to decipher the order of those experiences and their duration. So it's like changing states and moments in time. So it's you know. And it's a nice way of taking care of, uh, of um, thinking into account uh, biography, biographical time and to articulate it, to articulate it with uh, historical time. And so I wouldn't go through the package, but I will show you what you can do with this. Uh, sorry, I, I changed a bit the presentation because we don't have much time. When you use sequence analysis, there is a kind of result you do, it's a clustering. It's a clustering, each color corresponds to the on proportions. It, so we do it on the three, uh, the three spheres of life. Huh? But on proportions, you can, you can see that um, you have, um, so in, in, in pink, for example, mm -hmm. it's uh, the workers, okay, being a worker. Mm -hmm. And if you see from the age of 16, it's age, huh? uh, from 16 to 70, we have all our interviewees. Um, in, the, in the chart, and this cluster one is a cluster which is defined by uh, overrepresentation of workers. And the nice thing, you find workers in other, in other groups, but those workers will remain workers their whole life. Uh, only little part of them will, will, be, will, 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 will change profession, et cetera. So this is the kind of result we have that you can have also like in percentage, which is more I mean, easier to read. But of course with that, I mean, you can work on it because you, you did the analysis, but you can't put this in a paper, it makes no sense. I did it once, it was just like, uh, I mean, it's totally useless. So what you have is this, what you can do is that kind of graphs. Uh, for example, here, it's a very interesting graph that is not about like people, 
but about movement through people's participation, okay? So we have the people who have like the feminists, the leftists, the unionists, and we have like, so it's not the, evol the evolving of the movements through archives, whatever. It's like the people coming in and coming out of those three families. And, and this first, at, at first sight, is, is, it's, yeah, there are a lot of things which are like striking, which are real results. For example, if you take the red lines, the leftist, you can see that it started in 66, better than in 68, which is very important. Like the 68ers, for part of them, were active and very active, even more active than 68 before, okay? This, this, because there is this idea of the 68 generation that doesn't work actually, it doesn't work. If you, if you talk about 68 generation, it means you just look at one segment of the 68ers, the students who were. So it's more, it's, it's, it's more complex. And the other interesting thing is when the red line crosses uh, the green line, because we are like at, um, after 74, I mean, after Portugal, after the, the um, Carnation Revolution, say English, mm -hmm. the Carnation Revolution, which is a, for the leftists in France, a huge defeat. You know? It's a aborted revolution. Uh, after this, after Chile, after so many things, 73, 75, it is the end of this uh, leftist uh, upsurge. And then what happens? You can see here that certainly, it's an hypothesis that we can verify after, that those uh, leftists moved to unions, d'accord? So they stopped being activists in leftist movements. Leftist movements are disappearing, not all of them are disappearing, collapsing. And those people will remain activists, but in unions. Mm -hmm. It's also related, if you want to understand it, it's related, of course, to the, to the um, occupational story, like a progress. Mm -hmm. Because those people, those leftists, are more like young people, are more educated people. And once they arrive at around, like, uh, let's say, 10 years after, they're in a position where they need to find a job, they want to eat. And, 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 and then it's a way of conciling um, the necessity of finding a job and, and the will to remain an activist. And so those people will, we can show that those people will, will become unionists, so defend the workers' rights, but also will start to work in professions where they can exercise, when they can be activists and workers. For example, you're a lawyer, uh, and, or yeah, you're a lawyer, and instead of working for a company who is selling insurances, I don't know, you will, you will work for, for for a group defending uh, workers, like uh, uh, the, um, la sociologie du travail, work yeah. sociology, I don't know, and, 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 yeah. and inspector of work, like we have in France, we have those people who are inspectors going to, to companies and to see if everything is okay, et cetera. So we have massive translation to this. And, and for the feminists, you can see also that uh, the movement is, is actually not really strong at the beginning uh, in 68. Mm -hmm. It starts in, the, in 70 uh, in France and it culminates in 74, 75, because it's when the feminists uh, get the, the, like the big uh, success with abortion law. And after it starts to, to decrease. Okay, this is a way of, of um, I guess I will show you. Voilà. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you one more thing. Uh, one more thing about uh, the results. Here you have, so it's the people, that's a totally different graph from, from the other, and you have the ages, okay? okay, from 16 to 70. And here you can see, um, you can see the destiny, let's say, of the 68ers, which are really not the same, depending on your departure point and the resources you had, etc. For example, the red um, curve, is teachers, health and social workers, like helping professions and, and, and teachers. And those people are a lot in, in, our, in our group and they attain fixed position to become like civil servants, professors, teachers, very early in their career. And they will remain in this profession their entire life. Of course, on the right, what you see is just like the effect of retirement huh, when there's, there's a drop huh, after like uh, 58. If you look at the, I will not comment all of it. If you look at the workers, the green line, the light green line, you can see that uh, around the age of 30, 32, of, no, around the age of 26, sorry, there is, a, there is a drop in the number of workers. 
Okay, so those 60 acres were workers till um, like 74, 75 are less and less in those professions. They move to other professions and uh, it's more like acquired mobility. And this is illustrating something we all know that has been studied. It's uh, this phenomenon of refusal from people who are educated, uh, who, have, who, who are professionals to, to climb the social ladder. In French, we say les établis, like those people who decide to become workers and, 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 and to conduct revolution with the workers in the factories, okay? You know this, this phenomenon. And, and then you have this, you have this, um, this shown here very, very clearly. And then you can start to have an analysis of uh, the destiny of different social groupings from where we are part of the 68ers. And you can. Uh -huh. Sorry. Ah. Okay. I will finish here. And, and, and then at the end, you can show something which is nice and which is related to the first question we asked, um, our first question about uh, was what became of those uh, 60 acres. Did they all become like um, not rich, but like uh, professionals having nice occupations, etc.? The so result is totally uh, different. This is a table of mobility. So social mobility, 22%, of course, the same for everybody. And on the, on the right, you have the comparison with the population, the entire population. If you look at the downward mobility, um, at the neat mobility, you can see that 68 ers had a very high level of mobility hmm, compared to the population. Left it's 52. Uh, entire population 26%. It's also a period of very strong mobility. Huh? Well, in the mm -hmm. 70s, I don't say anything about it, but you know, it's a, like the entire population is moving up, okay? So of course, our, our activists are moving up too, but if you look at downward mobility, then you have another picture, which is exactly the contrary of what is said, because the downward mobility in this period for, for French is 4%, which means really that the entire population is moving up. Huh? Mm -hmm. But if you look at, at our activists, um, it's, not a, it's not the same story. It's 26% of downward mobility. And if you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dig in it, but if you compare leftist, feminist, trade unionist, you can see also that uh, feminist pays higher price. This says something about the cost of activism. Like 68 ers for a big part of them, did pay a very high price for what they did in terms of, of uh, occupation, of course, but not only, I have no time, but if you look at the same as Macadam results anyway, uh, if you look at their, their, um, their family life, their effective life, it's very different also, like the, the rate of divorce, uh, you have children later, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, I'm not saying it's, um, I wouldn't think in terms of cost here, it's a different way of living, <laughs> be careful. Uh, <laughs> voilà. And, and uh, for the professions, you no know, uh, no time to. Hello. Voilà. The last thing we did, and I will finish here, is to combine the sequence analysis with um, geometrical analysis, like the, the, the very classical way. We it's very French, huh? but we, we all do that in France because we're all Gaudiusians. <laughs> it's very efficient, I must say, those kind of representation. And here you can see, I mean, you have the, the whole picture. Actually here, we are having two maps superposed. There is one map which is related to uh, what happened to people before 1983. So the period we are studying and what people became or did after 83. So we have two period of time. Uh, and when it's um, in uh, Italic, um, how do you Italic? Ah, italico. Oh, I don't know. Italico, that's it. It's italico. Good. <laughs> uh, it's the first period and then the second period. And you can see that you have actually, I wouldn't um, give all the details, but you have three clusters, three main clusters. And the first axis, the vertical axis, is um, organizing the, the, the people in terms of social class. Okay, so the more the more educated, the, the, the best salary, the better profession you have, you are at the top of the, of the chart. And if you're a worker or an employee, whatever, you're at the bottom of the chart. 
And the other dimension, horizontal dimension, is um, related to on the left, that cluster three, yeah? on the left being older, being a man, being a worker, uh, being in trade unions more than the two other families. And on the right, or well, cluster two, uh, it's exactly the contrary, the younger women mostly, uh, helping professions, not, not, not very uh, well-paid professions, but stable, a stable life with no upward mobility. You stay stable, okay? And, 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 um, and then you can understand now what I said about the, the, the fate of women and men, etc. cetera. You, what, what you can see is that on personal three, so male workers and lifelong activists, you are in the region, let's say, where the mobility remains stable. People are workers, they remain workers, okay? And, and uh, you can see they're older, et cetera, et cetera. So on the other side, you have those, so women mostly, um, who are experiencing a descending mobility, like after the age of, of 30, 35, because they never, they never, they didn't take the chance, they didn't take the train of like uh, upward mobility in the 70s, huh? because mostly they refused to also. Um, like in the nurse sector, for example, it's very, very clear. Like those people will never become like the, the, the chief of, uh, I don't know how you say it in English, like uh, the um, chief nurse, I don't know, mm -hmm. in France where like a hierarchy like this. And then the last, and this is interesting, what is at the top of the, of the chart, well, the leftists, those are the leftist students who are younger, so younger people who have experienced an ascending mobility, et cetera, et cetera, who have the best professions at the end, and uh, who also are mostly from uh, Trotskyist groups, parties, more than from Maoist groups, et cetera. You can see that the more you are from, uh, close to trusted group, <laughs> I don't want to say anything, yeah? just, just a fact, uh, I have no interpretation. The more you are close to, the more you are close to Trotskyism, the more you succeed, okay? and, the, and no, I mean, <laughs> in that case, uh, when for Maoists, whatever, it's more complicated. And then what you, well, at the end, and I will finish on this, um, the entire story can be summarized in three points. Um, what was at play in the fate of those of the entire group of 68 um, was as I was like three dimensions which played a, a very important role in determining um, the life course of people. One is to be a woman or a man, no surprise. Uh, women did, did suffer much more from the, the I mean, as a result from 68. I mean, they really are absent from upward mobility. Uh, they pay the high cost in terms of professions. They also pay the high cost in terms of effective life. Um, for many reasons, I, I wouldn't dig here, etc. Another reason is also very classical uh, social origins, like primary socialization. Those who had resources from the very beginning are those who are students, younger, so students in 68, um, and who continued their studies as well as were activists, or they stopped studying for like five, six, seven years, became workers because they wanted to do the revolution in factories. But after five, seven, 10 years, you know, you're 35, nobody talks about revolution anymore. Uh, so you, you, you try to find a, a way of converting your, your knowledge as a student to new profession. So you go back to school or et cetera, and you have networks. So those people did succeed very well. And the third reason, which is less obvious is age, chronological age. Those people who in 1968 were already activists. So more, as I say, 17%, 17 of the people were born in the, in the 30s, huh? in the 68s. So they are already seasoned activists. They are in unions. They are married, they have children. For them, 68 will not be the, what it will be for young students first year in, in medicine, okay? Uh, so those um, will suffer more than the others because those we arrived in 68, just in, 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 um, in 68 at the university, who could continue studying two or three years, etc., had better chance to convert the resources in better professions 20 years, 15, 20 years after. 
And so at the end, we had three factors, being a woman, often sex, uh, social class, and chronological age. And here we are again in the like art structures, what we find at the end. But we knew it in advance in a way, except for chronological age. I think it was kind of a nice, I mean, it was interesting to see uh, this. But um, at the same time, I think we did a good job, I don't know what you think, by, by trying this collective biography. It's, it's full of uh, biases, whatever, huh? of course. But at the end, I think we, we, we could decipher like very different paths and, 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 and still we're not into like, um, let's say, a very individualistic, individual, individualistic way of thinking about like uh, social life. You know, it's not individuals, it's groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think I can stop here. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Ah, well, oh, because nice. my, my wow. Portuguese is improving. Mm -hmm. I think in two years, it yeah. will be better than my English. <laughs> Not that you mean that your English will uh, deteriorate? Uh, more than that, I don't think it's possible. <laughs> Thank you, Guya. <laughs> okay, so we wait for you in two years for a presentation in Portuguese. That's. Uh, I'm not that's sure I can, I, can, I can read this properly. <laughs> Atenção. <laughs> Obrigado pela vossa atenção e paciência. Oui, paciência. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks Olivier, you. I will I will finish the right. stop the share. Uh, maybe I can also interrupt the recording, and I think is uh, so that when we leave, uh, he's already on the.